Thursday night, July 28, 1966, almost midnight, one of the historical days in Nigeria, a day that can never be forgotten in a hurry. What happened in Abiokuta Garrison and the Second Battalion, Lagos? Commanding officer of the Abiokuta garrison was Lieutenant Colonel Gabriel Okunweze. He had previously been the second in command of the 1st Battalion in Enugu but was posted to Abiokuta following the January coup. Late on the 9th of July 28, Okunweze became concerned by reports he had received which indicated that another coup was imminent. Okunweze had received a tip from army headquarters warning him of a coup that night. To avoid a repeat of the killings that had occurred in January, Okunweze instructed Lieutenant Abdullahi Maman to wake up the officers and call a meeting in the officers' mess. Contrary to popular myth, which states that Okunweze invited only Igbo soldiers to the meeting, the officers who attended have vouched that all officers, regardless of ethnic, or regional origin were invited. Some of the attendees included Northern officers such as Lieutenant D.S.S. Abubakar I.I.S. Omar and Gabriel Idoko, the two most senior Northern officers in Abiyokuta. Captain Mohamed Ramawa and Damkat Bali were absent from the meeting as they had gone out to Abiyokuta Recreation Club. Lieutenant Roland Obuna had also gone out to celebrate his purchase of a new car. According to the officers attending the meeting, Okuweze informed them that Awuna had alerted him of an impending coup. Okweze urged any officer with information to come forward and promised that he would not report anyone for doing so. Okweze added that he did not want a repeat of the January shootings and that the best course of action would be to issue arms and ammunition to the soldiers in his unit so that they could defend themselves if a coup began. In response to Okweze's orders, an Igbo NCO went round waking up other soldiers with instruction for them for them to go and collect arms the fact that the nco was Igbo did not help to calm the fear of northern soldiers in the highly tense and emotional atmosphere any unfounded rumor minor misunderstanding or miscommunication was likely to spark violence this was particularly so at abiyokuta which had several of the most embittered conspirators such as lieutenant spam wadkon and is umar rather than calm tempers and nerves the meeting further agitated northern ncos who were not inside the mess some of the ncos had already planned a mutiny and assumed that the meeting with okueze was discussing plans to eliminate them a group of them decided that okueze's order was a chance to strike first against their Igbo colleagues this group included corporal john shagaya lieutenant pam Watcon of the Rees Squadron. Watcon was the duty officer and Shagaya was an instructor in communicate driving and maintenance. They decided to preemptively get organized and armed. Two Bakama soldiers in the unit, Sergeant Sabo Kwale and Corporal Maisamari Maje, had a pivotal conversation in their native tongue. The Bakamas are an ethnic group renowned for their warrior tradition and fighting capabilities. Kwale told Maje the unit Amora to ensure that weapons were issued to Northerners only. Another Northern soldier in the unit, Inuwa Sara, procured other Northern soldiers to man the armory and to assist in the selective distribution of weapons to Northern soldiers only. While Okunweze continued to address the meeting in the officers' mess, Northern NCOs led by Sergeant Sabu Kwale and Corporal Maisamari Maje started advancing towards the mess. The officers in the mess initially thought the NCOs were coming in to receive instructions and did not realize they were about to become a witness to a crime scene. Led by Kwale Amaje, the Northern soldiers stormed 
into the officer's mess, shot dead Lieutenant Colonel Okunweze and the commander of the Re Squadron in Abiokuta, Major John Obienu. Obienu had been billed to appear in the general major's coup but lost his nerve on the D Day and failed to show up. As will be shown later in this channel, this was not the last prominent act of revolt by Sergeant Sabo Kwale. Kwale was never punished for shooting Okuweze and Obienu. Years later, even his fellow Northern soldiers would regret their failure to take punitive action against him. After the shooting of Okuweze and Obienu, all hell broke loose as soldiers started running for cover as soldiers were in all directions. Initially, no one was sure which side Igbos or Northerners was responsible for the shooting. Lieutenant Orok, an Eastern officer of non Igbo origin, was out. When the shooting started, he returned to find the garrison in confusion. He was also shot dead after driving into the garrison and stumbling on the commotion occurring. Shortly afterwards, Captain Domkat Bali returned from his outing with Captain Ramawa and was shocked to discover the corpses of Okweze, Obienu, and Orok. Bali and Ramawa stumbled upon Obienu's bullets riddled corpse, still sitting in a chair inside the officer's mess. Ramawa and Bali got changed into full battle attire and tried to restrain the NCOs. However, not even the presence of Northern officers such as Ramawa and Bali could restrain the rage of some of the NCOs. Second Lieutenant Olanian was shot dead in the presence of Captain Bali who had promised him safe passage. As Bali was escorting him, Olanian was shot dead by other northern troops and died calling out Bali's name. Now in control of the Abiokuta garrison, northern soldiers conducted a door-to-door -door search for Igbo soldiers. When found, Igbo soldiers were shot and their bodies dumped into a vehicle parked near one of the officers' quarters. They also mounted roadblocks on main roads to and fro from Abiokuta. Initially, press reports were confused and many news outlets reported the shootings as the beginning of another coup by Igbo soldiers soldiers against Agui Ronsi. The northern officers of Abiokita delegated their most senior member, Captain Mohamed Ramawa, to telephone Lieutenant Colonel Gowon and inform him of what had happened. For the second time in six months, an army mutiny began in Abiokuta and spread to other cities. And also for the second time in six months, Ramawa found himself about to become an accomplice in a coup. During the January coup, he had provided vehicles to Captain Wobosi, on a way that Wobosi would use those vehicles to drive to Ibadan and attack Chief Akintola. This time around, he fully supported the coup. According to Lieutenant D.S. Abubakar, the Abiokuta officers feared that they would be isolated, arrested, and imprisoned. They resolved to fight on rather than let that happen. Now armed with the news of the Abiokuta mutiny, Lieutenant Colonel Gowon started phoning the various army formations around the country and warning them to be on alert. However, his calls to other army installations simply spurred Northern soldiers in those units into action. An Igbo member of the Abiokuta garrison, Lieutenant Roland Obunna had been out of the barracks when the trouble started but returned in time mayhem. Obunna was the commander of a company. When he arrived, he did not wait for clarification from the Northern soldiers but simply put two and two together, concluded another coup was in progress and fled. Obunna was unaware that one of his old classmates from the Nigerian military school, Inuwa Sara, was one of the ringleaders behind the military. Panic stricken, Obona managed to find his way to a police station from where he telephoned Lagos to inform the second battalion of what he presumed was an isolated mutiny in the Abiokuta garrison. Lady Locke smiled on the northern plotters. Obona call was answered by Lieutenant Nuhu Nathan, who was in on the coup plot. Lieutenant Nathan and M.M. Nasarawa alerted their superiors, Lieutenant Colonel Motola Mohamed and Major Martin Adamu. Motola was initially reticent and unsure whether events at Abiokuta justified reigniting the justified reigniting the counter coup plan. However, he decided that the Abiokuta mutiny created ideal conditions to restart the original plan for revenge. He ordered two separate groups of the Abiokuta mutineers under Lieutenant D.S. 
under Lieutenants D.S. Abubakar and Pam Mwadkon to head out from Abiyokuta to provide reinforcement for their co-conspirators in Lagos and Ibadan respectively. Mwadkon was ferried to Ibadan by Corporal John Shagaya. After being alerted of the Abiyokuta mutiny, Lieutenant Colonel Motlam Mohamed woke up Captain Joe Gaba of the Federal Guards updated him and told him to adjust to the expedited situation created by events of Abiyokuta. Motola departed to rouse other Northern soldiers in Lagos while Gaba in turn woke up his Federal Guards College Lieutenant Paul Tafa. As Gaba, as Gaba and Tafa were getting changed and preparing to mobilize the Federal Guards, a call came in from Lieutenant Colonel Gowan, confirming news of events at Abiyokuta and urging them. A group of the Abiyokuta mutinas arrived at the 2nd Battalion in Ikeja by early morning on July 29th to further ignite an already tense situation. The coup in Ikeja was initiated by Lieutenants Nathan and Nasarawa, who managed affairs until their superiors, Lieutenant Colonel Motola Mohamed, Major Martin, Adamu Shitu Alau and Musa Usman arrived. Other active participants in Lagos included Lieutenant Mohamed Buari of the 2nd Brigade Transport Company, Lieutenant John Longboem, Captains Ibrahim Taiwu and Alfred Gom, Lieutenant Tokida of the LGO, and a notoriously violent sergeant from the Idoma ethnic group named Paul Dixon. Igbo soldiers were shot dead in their quarters, some as they rose in the morning, others as they reported for physical training. Northern soldiers had pre-selected Igbo soldiers for elimination. Casualties in Ikeja included Lieutenant Pius Oyeneho and the unit education officer Captain John Chukweke, who was shot in the presence of his wife, children and mother-in-law. Lieutenant John Odigwe attempted to rescue Oyeneho but was unable to do so after he too came under heavy fire. Ironically, Oyeneho was a former classmate of one of the mutinous Nuhu later. Lieutenant Godson Mbebi and his wife were both shot along with Mbebe's brother-in-law, a schoolboy. Mbebe's wife survived her wounds. Captain Kevin Megua and his wife hid in their wardrobe while their young nanny went around the barracks weeping. Carrying their two months old baby girl, pretending they had been killed. The Ikeja airport in Lagos also turned into an execution ground under the command of the fearsome Sergeant Paul Dixon. Captain Okoye from Oduku's whose hometown of Newi, who was passing through Ikeja's airport, was captured, tied to an iron cross, beaten, whipped, and left to die an agonizing death in the guardroom in what bore the appearance of a ritual murder. Some of the Igbo survivors, military and civilian, at the airport were flogged on Dixon's orders. Dixon stayed on as head of security at the airport for several years and somehow bagged himself an automatic promotion to captain in the process and later again to major. The Air Force officer that had been briefed to fly to Calabar to release Chief Aolowo from prison, Major Zegu was also killed. Ironically, many of the Igbo officers attacked in Lagos were the same officers who played prominent roles in putting down the January coup. Two examples illustrate this. In January, Captain Ugala had act actually interrogated the coup detainees his anti-coup role in January was forgotten and he was killed by the Northern Mutinas. The house of the 2nd Battalion's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Iboba, was also targeted even though he was one of the officers that were instrumental to putting down the January coup. Now, be accused of meting out brutal treatment to January detainees. Northern soldiers surrounded Iboba's house, but Iboba managed to escape. And shelter at the police college in Ikeja. So, guys, thank you very much for watching and for staying tuned up to this extent. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more updates. We're we'll giving you guys more updates on the 1966 July rematch. We'll be giving you guys more details. So stay tuned, stay glued, subscribe, it's very important, and turn on the notification bell icon to get notified. See you next time.